Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths. We have another creationist contradiction today. This time we are pitting Dr. Nathaniel Jensen against Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. The competing arguments that we are going to talk about today are Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's time to most recent ancestor calculations for mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, and also Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's take on natural selection and the concept of continuous environmental tracking. Plot twist for this series, for that second one, Jensen's actually correct. Now I've talked about both of these things before, so see below for the videos on each of these topics. Before we get into what the problem is, we have to establish a bit of a foundation, and we're going to start with Nathaniel Jensen and the concept of a time to most recent common ancestor. What in the world is a TMRCA? Basically, the idea with the time to most recent common ancestor calculations is you want to know for some population of individuals how far in the past they shared a common ancestor. And that's what's illustrated with this figure right here. So what we're looking at is a population and this specific figure is from mitochondrial DNA, which is only uh, transmitted through the maternal lineage. So we have the current generation down here. We have the ancestors as you go from bottom to top. And if you trace back all the living women in this bottom generation, they all converge at this individual in the most distant generation, making that individual the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor for this population. The way you calculate the time to most recent common ancestor in general, the, the general idea, is that you survey the genetic diversity in this population and you see how different all of these individuals are from each other. And then using direct measurements based on known times of divergence, where two groups split from each other at a known time, you know the rate at which divergence builds up, at which the diversity accumulates within the population. Given the total level of genetic variation and divergence, the number of differences between the most different people in that population, given that number and the rate at which those differences accumulate, you can calculate backwards to determine how long it's been since all those individuals shared a most recent common ancestor. Now, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who, as I record this, works at AIG, has done these calculations for the mitochondrial DNA in humans and the human Y chromosome. He does this specifically using something called the pedigree mutation rate. It's a one generation mutation rate where you're looking at parents and their offspring and the number of differences. And using this mutation rate, he has calculated the Y chromosome most recent common ancestors to be 4,500 years ago, and the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor to be about 6,000 years ago. So he's calculated both of these things to fall right within the expected range for a young Earth time frame. What a coincidence. Now, I've talked at length about why he's wrong about this. I even had a conversation with him about this, so I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, but for today, what we need to talk about is the difference between the mutation rate and something called a substitution rate. The mutation rate is the rate at which mutations occur in a genome, just how fast do the changes happen. The substitution rate is the rate at which those mutations accumulate within a population. Another way to talk about mutation accumulation is to talk about the fixation rate. That's really what we mean when we're talking about a substitution rate, the rate at which mutations achieve fixation within a population. When a mutation achieves fixation, that means its frequency within the population is 100%. Everybody has that mutation. We use the substitution rate to calculate the time to most recent common ancestor because for different groups that we're comparing, we can actually look specifically at the fixed variation. Now, very importantly, Jensen's math only works if these two rates are equal. He has said clearly and directly that for his calculations, he's using a mutation rate as the substitution rate. Take a look. And I'm treating the mutation rate as a substitution rate. We'll see in a minute why that's going to be a problem for his other position in this video. So the second thing we're going to talk about is this idea called continuous environmental tracking and Jensen's problem with continuous environmental tracking. Before he worked at AIG, Jensen was employed by the Institute for Creation Research, 
or ICR. ICR is headed by Dr. Randy Galusa, there he is right there, and his big idea is this thing called continuous environmental tracking. It's basically an alternative mechanism of adaptation, and Galusa's big argument is basically that natural selection isn't real. Now, Jensen, interestingly, his correct position is that this is wrong. He actually wrote a critique of continuous environmental tracking while he was still employed at ICR. He no longer works at ICR, and continuous environmental tracking has basically become like the company line, especially in the last few years. They've really started to push this idea of CET in a major way. But Jensen wrote this piece talking about natural selection, basically arguing against Galusa's idea that natural selection is fake. So what's the contradiction here? In order to see the problem, we first have to look at the implications of Jensen's time to most recent common ancestor calculations. Jensen says the mutation rate equals the substitution rate. That's only true when there is zero natural selection. Instead, the frequency of mutations must be completely governed by something called genetic drift, which is a random process. It's random changes in allele frequency. Now, under drift, the likelihood of a mutation achieving fixation, the likelihood of it ultimately becoming present at every possible site for that mutation in the population, that is equal to the frequency of that mutation in the population. It's a simple positive correlation, just a direct one-to-one -one association between those two numbers. So for mutations that are present at 1% frequency within a population, they'll achieve fixation 1% of the time. Mutations present in 50% of the population, they'll fix in that population half the time. That's the association between frequency and fixation if the only thing governing the frequency of the mutations is random genetic drift. Now, we're going to illustrate this with a simple example because I want everybody to understand exactly what's going on here before we illustrate the problem. Warning, there is math on this slide, but don't worry, we're gonna keep it very simple. So I want you to consider a population of 1,000. So N equals 1,000, capital N, that just means population size. And the mutation rate, we're going to say for this population, is three mutations per individual per generation. So each individual in this population experiences three mutations. Now, when each of those mutations occurs, it occurs in a single individual, right? Mutations happen within individual genomes. So each mutation has a frequency of one in a thousand. For people that are want to nitpick right here, we're pretending this is a haploid population. Don't worry about anything like diploid genomes or recombination or anything like that. We're keeping it simple. If what I just said didn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. It really doesn't matter. That was for people who were about to nitpick me. So we're dealing with a haploid gener uh, population. Each mutation, when it occurs, has a frequency of one in a thousand, which means the chance of fixation is equal to that frequency. The chance of fixation is one in a thousand because we're dealing with a population that's just operating under genetic drift. So within a single generation, we have three mutations per individual, per generation. We have a thousand individuals, so we have 3,000 mutations per generation total. So let's multiply a little bit. We'll take our 3,000 mutations, we will multiply that number by a one in a thousand chance of fixation to reach 3,000 over 1,000. Or, to simplify that, three fixed mutations per generation. In other words, three substitutions per generation. When there's no natural selection operating, we get three mutations per generation as a mutation rate and three substitutions per generation as a substitution rate. But again, this is only going to be the case if there's no natural selection. So what happens if we add selection into the mix? Well, the way selection works is it's going to slow down the accumulation of mutations because it's going to remove harmful variants. If a mutation occurs that is harmful, it makes it less likely for the individuals who have it to reproduce, then that mutation may ultimately be selected out of the population, meaning it no longer exists in that population anymore. Now that alone is sufficient to invalidate Jensen's implicit assumption that natural selection is not operating, the assumption that goes into or underlies his time to most recent common ancestor calculations. But it's actually worse than that. 
because harmful mutations don't exist on their own in a vacuum. They exist in genomes that are also experiencing other mutations, some of which may be neutral, they don't have a cost or benefit in terms of fitness, and some of those mutations could even be beneficial, right? So you have harmful mutations existing with other mutations. And when harmful mutations get selected out of the population, they're taking those other mutations that are linked in the same genome with them, and you're also losing those other variants. So we can illustrate this graphically in a very simple representation here. Each of these gray bars represents a genome within our population. So we have three mutations within each of these genomes. Now let's just say that this purple mutation right here is harmful. So that mutation is going to get selected out of the population, meaning its frequency will ultimately be zero. It'll be gone. Now again, that enough breaks Jensen's math. His math no longer works once that's the case. But it's worse than that because you can't just take this individual mutation out of the population. It's this individual genome, this individual member of the population as a whole who is not going to pass on their genome as a whole. So you're actually removing all of the variants from that individual from the population, right? So we're removing not just the harmful variants from this population, we're removing the harmful variants and any neutral variants that are found with them that aren't found in anybody else. In other words, selection slows down the substitution rate by directly removing harmful variation and also causing the loss of neutral variation that's linked to those harmful genotypes. Now remember, according to Jensen, there must be no natural selection happening at all. That must be the case in order for his time to most recent common ancestor calculations to work. By making that argument that way, Jensen is very strongly siding with people like Dr. Randy Galusa, people who say that natural selection isn't actually a real evolutionary process. And he's taking a strong position against other creation scientists who say that natural selection is a real thing that happens and affects populations. Creation scientists like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. This is a short excerpt from Replacing Darwin Made Simple, the kind of simplified version of his 2017 book, Replacing Darwin. Here he writes, Furthermore, modern creationists have no problem with recent discovery in Darwin's finches. He's referring to things like speciation in the Galapagos finches. He goes on to say, From documented examples of natural selection in the field to the formation of new species of Darwin's finches, modern creationists not only have no problem with these findings, but they also enthusiastically endorse them. Jensen is actually correct here. Natural selection is a real thing, and most creation scientists acknowledge that it's a real thing, including Dr. Jensen and Answers in Genesis more broadly, which means that mutation rates do not equal substitution rates, which means that Jensen's time to most recent common ancestor calculations are nonsense. So in summary, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen calculates mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome time to most recent common ancestors that are consistent with the young earth timeline by rejecting natural selection and assuming the mutation rate equals the substitution rate. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen also says that natural selection is real and that modern creationists enthusiastically endorse natural selection as a real thing. He is correct about that. But what he's doing here is both denying that natural selection is real and insisting that natural selection is real at the same time. That is a contradiction inherent to Dr. Jensen's work as a young earth creation scientist. Natural selection is fake and not actually affecting things like the human genome. And also natural selection is a real thing that we could observe in nature and creationists enthusiastically endorse it. That is a problem, and I once again ask creationists to get their story straight. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this installment in the Creationist Contradiction series. If that is the case, please hit the like button down below, and if you are not already a subscriber, please subscribe. As always, don't get fooled.